Welcome to the World Nomads podcast, delivered by World Nomads, the travel lifestyle and insurance brand. It's not your usual travel podcast. It's everything for the adventurous, independent traveler. Thank you for hitting play on this episode of the World Nomads podcast with Phil and myself, Kim, in which we feature Bhutan. Look, a few things I've learned. Only carbon sink in the world, highest unclimbed mountain in the world, 72% forest cover. Yep. Highest unclimbed mountain, happiest country in the world. We'll find out why a little later. Total tobacco ban, or at least why the pigs are. No traffic lights in the entire country. And television was banned until 1999. Now, in this episode, we will venture, be prepared, far and wide. From discussing the daily tariff, which... You know, could be a little off-putting to some people. For for inbound tourists, you mean? Yeah, exactly. Uh, To the 10-inch wooden phallus that monks use to bless you. I'm loving this country. (laughs) Why would a nomad want to experience Bhutan? Uh, Do you mean because of the, you know, the daily tariff? You actually have to fork up a couple hundred US dollars a day just for the privilege of travelling there, correct? That's off-season, yeah, and a little more when it's um, popular. Yeah. Look, I think, I mean, we've discussed discussed this before when we're talking about over-tourism. I think... Everybody's got a you know right to travel, but it's a bit of a privilege, and I think you may have to pay for that privilege sometimes. And and being a world nomad is not all about you know getting by on five bucks a day and what have you. There are some experiences out there that will be worth having, like visiting Bhutan, and it's about you know getting value for however much money it's cost you. So even if you're spending a few hundred dollars a day, I think Bhutan should be high on the list for a world nomad because it is such a unique place. It's so different and it is so culturally rich. You are not kidding, as you will find out in this episode. Alex is a traveller with a blog called Lost With Purpose. Now, this is a girl you won't find sipping coconut water on a beach in Bali. (laughs) She prefers places like Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iran and Bhutan. I've got all the arms in there. Yeah, (laughs) (laughs) there's the stands and then there's the arms. The arms, yeah. yeah. We caught up with her to talk about Bhutan's daily tariff that uh, Phil just touched on and ask the big question, look, is it worth it? So a lot of people cringe when you think of the, or when you hear of the 200 to 250 a day fee, but it's not so much a tourist tax as it is an all-inclusive fee. You're basically paying to go on a tour in Bhutan. And so the 250 a day includes your accommodation, your transportation, your guides fees, your foods, entry fees for wherever you're going that day etc, etc. And though it seems like a lot, especially relative to other countries in the region, um, what Bhutan is doing with that money is actually quite good. A good portion of that money goes towards sustainable development within the country, so building infrastructure, providing free healthcare and education for everyone, stuff like that. Um, So your money is not just disappearing into some deep, dark governmental pocket. It's actually being put to good use and for the most part covering basic tourist expenditures. Well, because Bhutan is one of the first countries and maybe the only country that uh, not only measures GDP, but it measures happiness. It has a happiness index as well, which is part of government uh, policy. Yeah. I mean, how... Whether or not they actually measure happiness that much or not measure happiness but hold it to that higher regard within the country, I'm not entirely sure about that. That wasn't necessarily so evident when I was there. I think people are generally somewhat content, or they're content, um, but I wouldn't say that the there's an immense amount of happiness within the country necessarily. Oh, no, I think but but more but, like a media spin. Yeah, but at least it's on the radar of the government as yeah. one of the priorities that they want. Which yeah, is I mean, the government the- definitely prioritises um, the important things. Like, they do value the well-being of their people. Um, something that I really admire is that they put a strong value on maintaining forest coverage in the country. I believe it has to be a minimum of 60% or something like that. Um, And currently it's around 70 something percent. So the government has the environment at the forefront of its plans. Is Bhutan worth the money? I think Bhutan is absolutely worth the money. If you have the money, it's worth the money. Um, It's hard to find a country that's finding such a healthy balance between kind of traditions from the days of yore and modernity, like more globalized aspects of culture are starting to creep in. Like you'll see kids walking around in Nikes in the capital. 
Um, everyone has smartphones in the bigger cities, but I think that it's generally been quite well preserved, but not in a museum sort of sense. They're not being forced to maintain any kind of traditions. It's not like super contrived. This is just the way that things are. And because the government really puts maintaining its culture at the forefront of its planning, um, yeah, it comes off as quite authentic without being contrived. And so I think that itself makes it worth the money. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that it's still authentic, but I do worry about it being um, uh, being kept as somewhere that's a privilege to go to or somewhere that, um, you know, it's kind of cast in concrete and never changes? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think travel is inherently a privilege regardless of where you're going. It's a privilege, not a right. Um, And I think that if the cost barrier makes it a luxury privilege only, if that's what it takes to maintain the country's well-being, then so be it. And other countries in the region like Nepal or India that are just totally overrun with backpackers and some of them are culturally quite sensitive and others are just there to smoke as much weed as humanly possible and bum around somewhere for as cheap as possible. Um, I think in a country like Bhutan that only has what 800,000 people in the country, um, I think it's good to try and maintain a balance between foreigners swooping in and doing as they will and the local population maintaining a normal way of life. I guess what bothers me is there's kind of a, you know, given that most travellers that go to Southeast Asia, it's a very Western thing to uh, have the uh, ability to travel in that way. And then, as you say, swooping in in your, uh, you know, elephant pants and smoking weed is one kind of, um, you know, cultural imperialism but then it kind of bothers me that Bhutan I mean and it's expect $250 a day it's a lot of money mm-hmm. so it kind of is that making it a, a you know a, a luxury enclave or you know a, a place only for the rich I don't know I feel I, I'm conflicted by that yeah I was also quite conflicted about that because I mean I went to Bhutan as part of a sponsored trip it was a place that I would never be able to go afford to go to any time in the near future, possibly ever. But it wasn't really something that I questioned because I understood that it was a manner of filtering out kind of people who are less concerned about the country they're visiting so much as just trying to check something off of a bucket list or hit up every country. And all of the tourism officials and people in the industry that I spoke to in the country, they all agreed that they thought it was a very effective way of screening tourists. They said that all the tourists that they had were incredibly respectful of the local cultures and much more engaged and interested in the country because of the effort and finances that they had to put forward to visit the country. And they said that they weren't just getting immensely wealthy people. There are people who had been saving for years and years and years to go to the country. So it's not just an enclave for the rich tourists. But what sort of experience do you have once you're there? So once you're there, it kind of depends on where you choose to go. A lot of the people are just choosing to go to, they go to Thimbu, the capital. They go to Paro to see the Tiger's Nest, which is the famous monastery up in the mountainside. They go to Punaka to see the one of the largest zong fortresses in the country and so there it is a kind of like show up see the highlights see a pretty fortress see some fancy buddhist things done and over um but as the country starts to kind of increase in popularity and get some repeat tourists more people are branching a bit further out into the country going to the far north or the far east um i myself started in the south of the country that very few people go to people were really surprised to see foreigners there to begin with they're like why did you want to even come here anyway (laughs) um and so there it was more like very quiet villages with really idyllic little picture perfect houses on the mountainside and a lot of like rice terraces and there was just i mean a lot of my days were just kind of wandering around and chatting with people that i encountered sometimes with a guide sometimes without um for part of my tour i had a private guide and he was basic. he was immensely flexible. He was like, okay, what do you want to do? We could do this. If you want to do this, so be it. Do you want me to come with you and translate? If you do, sure. If you don't, also fine. I'll see you later. Um, So that was really nice and far more flexible than I had anticipated. Um, And then for the other part of my tour, I was with a larger group of about 10, 15 people. And we went to a Highland, the Royal Highlander Festival in Laya, which is Bhutan's northernmost settlement. And that was really wild because it was a two-day trek up to 
this small town in the mountains. Um, and it was a festival to celebrate nomadic traditions and cultures in Bhutan. And so nomadic tribes from all over the northern bits of the country came together for to show off sports and dance and other cultural activities. The king came. I love it how you just threw that away. The king came. Yeah, the king. Oh, yeah, the king by the way, <laughs> by the way, I got to meet the king of Bhutan. <laughs> <laughs> he was the one who spearheaded this festival. He started it because he wanted to bring more attention to the northern area of the country. And what better way to do that than a festival? So he actually started this festival, and he makes the trek up to the festival himself every year on foot. Even though he's a king, he does not get helicoptered up, he walks up. And so he came to the festival for the first two days to come and say hello and shake hands and, yeah, greet the people. And so that was pretty wild. He also looked like a Bhutanese version of Tom Cruise in <laughs> uh, Top Gun because he had his hair slicked back and had aviators on and was just like so cool and charming as he was gliding through the crowd. So that was cool. And so that was a lot of fun because the tour group would just kind of come together in the morning, have a little bit of a chat, have a bit of breakfast, and then we could just disperse and go off on our merry way and do whatever we wanted during the festival and then come back later. What I loved about that story was that you straight away you separated the money from how a nomad wants to travel. Would you agree, Phil? Yeah. Oh, totally. Yeah, absolutely. The way you separate the money from how a nomad wants to travel, what do you mean? Uh, I mean, travelling responsibly and, you know, being able to make your own choices and then being able to, you know, connect with the people that you meet is part of what being a nomad is about, you know, what we believe at World Nomads anyway. And it seems as though, you know, like that 250 bucks a day has melted away because it's enabled this really special kind of travel. Yeah, I'm like you. I don't want to have a super rigid holding your hand. We have to do X, Y, and Z. And if we don't, the world will end kind of thing. Freedom and flexibility is paramount in any kind of adventure. Thank you for that, Alex. And if you think a Tom Cruise lookalike complete with Sunnies is out there as a leader, take a listen to Marie. Now, she joined me to chat about Bhutan's obsession with penises, amongst other things. Well, when I was in Bhutan, uh, this was 2011, so it's a a ways back now. Um, One thing that was, I had read about this in advance, and this was less common than I expected, but a lot of places in more rural areas, there is, there are phalluses, there are phallic paintings on the side of uh, village buildings across towns all throughout rural Bhutan. So basically it's a decorative penis, if you will, and it's got a, usually got a ribbon tied around it and hairy balls. Um, and there's often um, some little liquid coming out of the top and Okay, that's unusual, right? <laughs> Where we live, that's unusual. Um, they, you also can find wooden carvings, like phallus carvings in tourist areas. And in one place, in fact, um, there was a monastery that my guide took me to where, um, yeah, I don't know really what's going on. I am sort of trying to keep up. And next thing you know, I'm being blessed by the monk. In other words, he's tapping me on the head with a wooden phallus. Um, And yes, I was blessed. That was, I have no idea why, but (laughs) this is, this is the thing they do there. So it was really interesting. It's not obscene. This is um, symbol. It's a part of their religion. So, and their culture. And what it is, is that the phallus, as it's called there by those with better manners than, say, I do, um, (laughs) that I have, it's intended as a tribute, and it's a celebration of the divine madman, which is Bhutan's favorite saint. So he um, was known, he was a bit of a prankster, and he would do things like teach entire villages lessons on impermanence with his farts. (laughs) Oh, he's... (laughs) (laughs) All this from a country right. that kind of didn't really open themselves up into the to the world until you know in recent times. Yeah, and I mean this is why this still exists too. But like Bhutan is on the cusp. It's it's one of these places where they're sort of wrestling with modernization and how to maintain and keep their their actual culture. So in the cities, you see a lot less of the the phallus 
paintings. You don't see it as much. It's um, as they become more of our interpretation of sophisticated, there there is less of it, you know. So this is a part of the culture that they're trying to maintain, but, you know, much like their traditional dress um, and their attitudes toward animals, you know, their Buddhist attitudes to uh, have more sustainable lifestyles, these are things that are on the front lines of the uh, attempts to sort of find a compromise between the modern and the traditional. Yeah, nice. Now, you also learnt um, when you were there or discovered, in fact, that women wear the trousers. Can you uh, explain? Oh, well, women are the only people who can inherit property in Bhutan. So uh, sort of a sister would inherit the property and the, the brother has to go in. If he gets married, he has to move in with his wife and her extended family. Um, if he is single, then he might go and rent somewhere, or maybe his sister will let him live on the farm with her. Um, he can earn enough money through working to uh, buy some property, but he will not inherit it uh, ever. So that's interesting. And, uh, you know, it kind of, I can see how that logic happened and how it got to that, because maybe when women didn't really work outside the home as much, this was a way to be more um, equal. Uh, men do own property, but they have to buy it. They can't inherit it. Fascinating. So what was your, and that word fascinating comes to me every time we chat or read anything about Bhutan. What did you make of it? Um, Bhutan was overwhelming to me. I was there about 10 days. Bhutan has a daily set fee. Uh, you, you can't wander in the way you do in, say, Nepal, right? So in Nepal, you have tourists everywhere just doing everything. Um, in Tibet, you don't have any tour. Like you're, you know, you have to really, it's very rigid. The access, I feel like it's three kingdoms and you can compare them. One of them, well, not kingdoms, three countries that you can compare. And Tibet is really hard to get into. Nepal is really easy to get into. And Bhutan is trying to find its way balancing between those two. This admission fee, ultimately, when I started to break it down, it turns out that that fee per day, which I think now is it's more than when I went. When I went, I had to pay $240 a day, um, which is why I was there 10 days instead of, you know, a month. Yeah. <laughs> but it includes your guide, which is compulsory. It includes your driver, which is compulsory. It includes your hotel room. You, your, it includes your meals. It's basically all paid for. So while that is still prohibitive to a budget traveler, it is actually quite in line with what leisure travelers pay who are, you know, who don't travel necessarily the way you or I might. They want to have tourists, but they want to control it and do it in a sustainable way, which is really how they try to do everything there. They try to find a way forward that is sustainable and that is socially responsible, but it's treated to us um, as this idyllic remote kingdom in the clouds where they don't have MTV and they don't have plastic bags, single-use bags. All of that is, uh, of course, a ridiculous cliche and an exaggeration. That's not really what it is. Um, it is scenic. It is clean. It is socially responsible. They're trying to find ways to accommodate you know, multiple conflicting needs of the people. So everyone recycles, pigs are fed weeds, which in, to my surprise, they are fed pot. <laughs> so if there is <laughs> marijuana growing by the side of the road, they will pick it and feed it to the pigs. <laughs> um, penises and blue ribbons are painted on buildings in rural areas. Farts are uh, funny, like everywhere. Dogs run freely in the streets barking because nobody wants to lock up the dogs because that would be rude to the dogs. Um, everyone there knows what to do when you see a Yeti. No one has actually seen one, but everyone knows exactly what you're supposed to do. With the male Yeti, they have long hair and they will trip over it. So you run one direction. The other one, the female Yetis have really long flopping breasts and they'll trip over those. So you run the other way. So everyone knows what to do when you see a Yeti. So it's a really interesting place. Okay, let me clear up a couple of things. The Divine Madman is Maverick Saint, 
Drukpa Kunli. Do you reckon I've pronounced that correctly? <laughs> no idea. <laughs> Why am I asking you? <laughs> and he introduced Buddhism to Bhutan. And as Marie said, he was known for his crazy methods of enlightening other beings, mostly women, Phil, which earned him the title The Saint of 5,000 Women. <laughs> <laughs> Enlightened to within an inch of your life. Yes, yeah, right. exactly. Okay. He was also a poet and a songwriter. Now, this is a, a okay. little example of his poetry. I am happy that I am a free yogi, so I grow more and more into my inner happiness. I can have sex with many women because I help them to go the path of enlightenment. Outwardly, I'm a fool. Inwardly, I live with a clear spiritual system. Outwardly, I, I enjoy wine, <laughs> women and song. And inwardly, I, will, I work for the benefit of all beings. Outwardly, I live for my pleasure. And inwardly, I do everything in the right moment. Outwardly, I'm a ragged beggar. Inwardly, a blissful Buddha. Do you know how that's, you know, alternate um, sentences there? Yeah. Yeah, I'm only one of each. I'm not the other one. I'm just the first <laughs> okay. one. Okay. <laughs> so you outwardly enjoy wine, women and song. You that's outwardly it. live for pleasure. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> so, so what do you make of the divine madman? Yeah, look. Yeah. He had a bit of fun. He's had a bit of fun. And if you can get away with that, then <laughs> yeah. I'm not trying it, though. Uh, no. Oh, now no. to those pigs that get high. Now, apparently true, not that I doubted Marie, marijuana does grow <laughs> plentifully in Bhutan. While it's illegal for the locals to smoke it, that doesn't stop farmers feeding it to their pigs. Now, why? And also, as Buddhists, they used to import their meat because right. from India because they had an issue with killing it, but... That they seem to have relaxed their rules on that. So they feed it to the pigs. They get the munchies, which is what happens if you have marijuana. You is that right? Yeah, apparently. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. You want to eat <laughs> and eat a lot. So the pigs become nice and fat. What's travel news? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, right. Okay, travel news. Actually, it's big news right now, but it's actually a bit of a lesson for whenever you're listening to this episode in the future because another airline has gone bust in Europe. Um, it's called Wow Air and it's based out of Iceland and they uh, have just declared bankruptcy. I think there were like five medium-sized airlines in Europe went bankrupt last year and this is like the – third already this year in 2019. So it's rising fuel prices and costs like that. Wow. Well, exactly. <laughs> well, and then an F word. Yeah. Well, look, thousands of people are, are stranded because of, you know, the sudden closure of this airline because they fly from Iceland to US, Canada and to places in Europe and even to Tel Aviv. So it was a really cheap way of doing the transatlantic thing. So lots of travellers are using it for that. Right. So they've all now been just stranded. What do you do, though, if you have a ticket with an airline that goes bust? Oh, uh, well, look. Wow Air has put advice on their website, which is exactly the same advice I would give as well, which is you've got to check available flights with other airlines. Um, some of the airlines will be offering flights at reduced rates, what they call rescue fares. Yep. Maybe able to help you out there, so check with that. If you've paid with a credit card because the service hasn't been delivered, you may be able to get a refund from that. And then if you bought your uh, – plane fare with WOW as part of a package tour in Europe, then the European rules around package tours, the protection there, you should be able to speak to your uh, 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 travel agent and they should have to arrange you on another flight to get yep. you where you need to go. You may also be con uh, entitled compensation from WOW Air, but you're going to have to join the queue and get that from the liquidators when that happens, so good luck with that one. But what about travel insurance, I hear you say? Did I hear you say? What about travel insurance? I'm glad you asked, Kim. Well, look, it depends on who your provider is because insolvency is handled in a number of different ways. Some of them simply don't cover it. Even World Nomads plans handle it differently depending on your country of residence, so you do have to read up on the policy. But for US customers, I can tell you what the policy wording says here. And uh, we will pay a benefit due to bankruptcy only if no alternate transportation is available, which means if another airline helps you out with one of those rescue fares and you're sorted, then that's it. But if alternate transportation is available, the benefit that you can get will be limited to the change fee you get charged. So if you get one of yeah. the rescue fares, but it also costs you another 50 bucks or something like that, then that's what it's limited to. So, But look, it's really complicated. So um, speak to your uh, travel insurance provider, especially if you're a world nomads, we'll help you out there. And having all said that, you know what has to happen next, Kim? Yes. 
This information is only a brief summary. Read the full policy wording very carefully. Visit worldnomads.com. That's all you need to do. It's general advice and it may not be right for you. Read the full policy. It really won't take long. At worldnomads.com. Everything in this episode, poetry, music, <laughs> Now, Bhutan is not only the happiest, but also one of the greenest countries in the world. They not only are carbon neutral, but reportedly carbon negative, and they've built sustainability into their national identity. So how do we make sure we don't ruin all their good work and be a responsible traveller? And that, Phil, is not just to Bhutan, but generally. Let's ask Molly Mack. Um, To me, it's not just about kind of being low waste and green, but it's also about kind of not stepping on the foots of the local people, on the feet of the local people. Respect the, the local culture, even if we don't agree with it. Um, we also try to, you know, not use plastic water bottles. We also try not to fly that much. Um, so it's really for us, like, two-pronged respect of respecting the earth and respecting everyone who lives on it, whether or not you agree with them, especially if you're in their local environment. Well, that's an interesting point, like whether or not you agree with them. We we had some people comment on – well, I had a person comment on one of our um, articles on World Nomads recently talking about women's safety, where the usual advice, of course, is, you know, dress modestly and, you know, don't travel at night and what have you. And as the, uh, as the post has said, well, you know, it's not up to women to change their behaviour. It's up to men to change their behaviour. What do you do in those situations? You say you've got to respect it even though you don't agree with it? Yeah, that's kind of what we do. I mean, generally, I, I, I do agree that it's it's not up to the women. Like, I should be able to go and wear whatever I want, wherever I want. But if you're somewhere, um, we travel a lot in Central Asia, and, you know, the women don't show their knees there, and you're going to draw excess attention to yourself if you do. And um, if you want to make a statement... And do that, that's, you know, that's your prerogative. But for me, I'm not trying to stand out and I don't want to make people feel uncomfortable the same way. I don't want people to come into my home and make me feel uncomfortable. Um, And also it's just, it makes for a more enjoyable travel experience because maybe you don't agree with people, but you're going to be welcome to talk with them and um, learn about their culture. Um, You're going to be just more welcome than you would be if you're just, you know, saying, I don't care about your culture, I don't care what you believe, I'm going to walk around, you know, in my booty shorts and deal with it. (laughs) So as we say, immersing yourself in the local culture is really the best opportunity that you have to have a real authentic travel experience. And do you you think... I I think there was one time I really got sick of it, but we were in the, like, middle of nowhere hiking in Tajikno, Kyrgyzstan, in, like, a walnut forest, and I put on my Nike shorts. And immediately our guide said something about it. What was wrong with putting on your Nike shorts? They were too short. They showed my thighs. In a walnut forest. Who's going to see you? That was my thought. I was like, I'm so respectful all the time, but it's really hot. And I'm going on a hike in a forest and just the guide. And and at that time, my boyfriend, I was like, what does it really matter? (laughs) (laughs) Have you taken the opportunity, just going on this about, you know, having a proper travel experience, connecting with people. Do you think you've had the opportunity to do some education back the other way as well, rather than just, you know, rolling over and accepting what's happening? And do you think you've been able to express to other people that maybe their rules are not right? I, I, I'm sure we have. I mean, uh, my, my biggest things that what I usually will talk to people about is um, when I see littering, usually I say something like, why don't you put that in the trash? Like it doesn't belong there. Um, I also, usually when I see like animal cruelty, I, I say something, even if it's someone just, you know, you'll stay at a hostel and someone's kicking a cat. I'm like, that's really not the right thing to do. Um, but a lot of times I, I don't try to get into like political talks with people unless I'm feeling very, very comfortable with them. Yeah. Especially since a lot of places I've traveled have been more remote in third world and they're just like, oh my God, it's someone visiting here in general. <laughs> Yeah. You kind of want to make a, a good impression for other people who may come through. So have you always travelled with this, you know, social responsibility mindset or is that something that you learned? Um, I think it's definitely something that I learned um, also because I didn't really start travelling until I was a bit older. I was, you know, I wasn't 19 or 20. I was, I think, about 24, 25 
Um, so just the awareness of the world around me and the places I was going. Um, but also I think it's because I worked as a tour guide in Italy and I just saw so many disrespectful American students around and I didn't want to be that person. <laughs> Some of the other tips that you offer to travel responsibly, including things that we've talked about on po- previous podcasts, like shopping locally and, um, yeah. yeah, but also never giving money to children. Y- yeah, that's, that's controversial and it, it can be hard. You see, you know, a, a child who's, you know, in a really desperate situation, but the amount of times that that money is really going to that child to buy food is very few and far between. And the ultimate point is that a child shouldn't be in the street. They should be at school. And if they're out there collecting money, whether it's for their family or in some cases it's for like, like they're, they're basically slaves out there at the street collecting money for someone else. Um, but if, if you're out there and they're giving their money, and even if it's just for their family, their family will say, oh, it's more important to be on the street making money than it is for schooling. Um, and then they have no social mobility and they're stuck in this cycle. People also tend to give out like pencils or notebooks or even candy. And that's also something that I'm wary of because I feel like if you want to make a true change, there's always like a local school you can donate those things to um, instead of giving it to the children. Um, so you're like, you're being sure that it's going to the right place and going to be used the right way. Um, you really, you really never know. <laughs> yeah. And there are some great charities that have been set up exactly like that. So that you are giving and it's going directly to benefit those children. There's <laughs> so much to be wary of. Like there's a lot of research that you really have to do. Molly's travelled independently to 40 countries, always with an eye to environmental and social sustainability. She works for Echo Bags, and their mission is to offer thoughtful, ethically and sustainably sourced, durable, reusable bags. Say that quickly five times. <laughs> uh, that inspire people to reduce, reuse, recycle and reimagine the world that we live in. Yeah, leave no trace and do no harm. Good idea. Our next guest is one of the founders of Bhutan Homestay. Now, Yuli has lived in Bhutan on and off for many years and she's conducted ethnographic research on traditional hospitality practices, travelling and gift exchange in rural, rural communities. She'll explain that further. So she's very familiar with village livelihoods all over Bhutan. Bhutan. But how did it come about? Yeah, that's uh, quite an interesting story. So in um, 2011, I, I started my PhD program in, at UCL in London. And I stayed with uh, my Bhutanese friend um, in London at her house. And one evening we were sitting and discussing that. I'm, and I'm my degree is in social and cultural anthropology. So we were just sitting at the dinner table and talking about tourism in Bhutan and how wouldn't it be nice to for tourists to be able to stay in farmhouses because I spent so many years in Bhutan um, basically visiting farmhouse, farmers and staying with farmers in rural areas where tourists usually don't reach or during those days didn't reach. So then this whole idea came up, um, you know, um, setting up a tour operator in Bhutan by my Bhutanese friends and they told me I can basically develop the concept and implement my ideas and that's how it all started and well how has tourism changed Bhutan well actually what what I feel has changed most well, is the infrastructure it's made be the the road infrastructure guest houses facilities over the past 15 years have really improved uh, a lot so the first time I was in Bhutan you barely found a guest house in rural areas but now you have um, really along the main uh, road with they call it the highway through Bhutan it's going from the south in Finseling to Timpu the capital till the east and again you can exit from Samdutsonka which is the water town in the east Uh, basically you find guest houses and hotels all along this route Um, and you know Timpu the capital has really grown immensely it's uh, (laughs) basically the the population has uh, tripled over the past 10 years and there's a lot of issue with uh, uh, r- uh, rural urban migration because of that the, 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 the most of the impact is is on the infrastructure actually 
So what then is a, is a typical homestay like as opposed to, you know, checking into a motel or a hostel? Yeah, so in Bhutan you have um, different categories of homestays. You have homestays, for example, nearby towns or in towns where um, you have facilities um, that are not necessarily at it's not necessarily with attached farm you stay with a family you you eat with the family and you have uh, indoor plumbing toilets uh, maybe sometimes attached to the bedroom whereas um, in rural areas in villages you really can stay you can stay in farmhouses where it's very traditional once in a while there are tourists so it's not uh, it's not a mass touristy thing it's just occasionally they will host guests so it's really like you are one in one once in a while a foreign guest in their house and uh, facilities uh, range from attached bathroom to the bedroom um, to toilets outside in front of the house so it's really up to the guests what they think they can actually handle and how much immersion they want well yeah on that with someone with a phd in traditional hospitality practices and gift exchange in rural communities. <laughs> what are some of the cultural activities that uh, Bhutanese families get visitors involved in doing? Yeah, that's great. Actually, I really like enjoy staying in the village homes because uh, not only for some people, they just like to what we call hang out and observe and just enjoy it you know, sitting around and um, watching people going about their chores. But you can also participate, for example, um, milking the cows in the morning, um, helping with field work, depending on the season. You can go and, and help with the, you know, weeding or um, harvesting or uh, firewood collection in the forest. Or you can later on... in the, watch them how they or try yourself how to churn butter make cheese you know all these little chores in a in on farms that, that are basically multi-resource so they have cows they have fields they have vegetable gardens so there's a little bit of everything how does this type of experience differ to the ones that we've heard earlier in the podcast about the guided visits the minimum spend etc well actually it's um, you can only travel to Bhutan uh, based on uh, pre-planned itineraries and uh, based on this um, daily tariff. So no matter if you stay in a farm stay or if you stay in a hotel, you will have uh, to pay the same tariff, and you your tour will always be accompanied by a guide and a driver, and it will be pre-planned. So that won't change, but. It's a choice you have uh, that we offer. If you, for example, are more interested in getting closer to people, learn about uh, everyday village life, um, you know, um, take part and participate in their life. Uh, uh, also take part in cooking classes, weaving classes, uh, basket we uh, bamboo weaving classes or paper making classes, anything that's been done at the local village level, then uh, this option is is uh, is there. But um, it's you're not exempt from the daily tariff and your tour is still, it still falls under these sort of restrictions, I would say. So will that, do you think, and I think you just, you mentioned that, that that current method of the daily tariff will remain? Yeah, that remains. That's the basic tourism, the basic policy in Bhutan that they regulate uh, tourist arrivals through this tariff. That's uh, 250 US dollar during high season and uh, 200 US dollars um, during low season. Uh, but it includes um, your overnight uh, guide, driver, transport, uh, three meals a day. Um, so. You basically only have to buy drinks and uh, your souvenirs. So in summing up, is there anything that you'd like listeners to know about Bhutan? Yeah, I, I think that in it's Bhutan is a great place to visit if you really want to see a place that's not overrun with tourists. And one thing you should do is you should really plan your trip properly and try to get away from the main um how to say from the main tourist routes and get a little bit into the valleys. Um, the thing you have to you to be aware of is that the roads are not very good. So the moment you leave the main highway, the roads will be a little bit uh, how to say 
not very well maintained, but uh, you will be rewarded with uh, great uh, immersion into um, more traditional village life. And there are certainly places where not many tourists reach. And occasionally our guests, for example, in, in East Bhutan, East Bhutan is a great place to visit. And sometimes our guests have been to places where they stumbled o over festivals where they were the first ever tour tourists to visit and they were treated like um, chief guests so that's really what you can, st can still experience in Bhutan if you if you plan and tell your agent what you're interested in and you know um, what you would like to do a lot of information prior to your arrival is good for the tour operator and for yourself and Yuli says your experience in Bhutan stands and falls with your guide. So do your research. Now that brings us to the end of the episode on Bhutan. Oh, look, I hope I've said that correctly because I've heard other. <laughs> Stop smiling at me. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned Iceland earlier. While you're on a roll with your earbuds or your headphones in, check out an earlier episode on the Land of Fire and Ice to find out more about it. I mean, personally, the only one I can think of that isn't talked about as much is Fjallraugluvin, which is on the way to the Glacial Lagoon, and I don't think everyone goes there. Okay, let's just stop there. How did Alex pronounce that name? Fjallraugluvin. Now, Phil? Bjardsgolf. Uh, Alex? Fjallraugluvin. Phil? Bjardsgolf. No. No. A massive fail. <laughs> like... Hey, what do you think of the podcast? Because uh, we want to know what you think about it. We actually built a survey and we want to ask you just a few simple questions about what time of day you listen to it, what you like about it, what you don't like about it. Personally, for me, it's you, but, you know. <laughs> oh, it's terrible. You've you got to watch what you wish yeah, for, all right? Yeah. No, but be honest. Do the survey for us. It's embedded on the show notes. So uh, hop onto the show notes at worldnomads.com forward slash podcasts and fill in the survey for us. We'd really appreciate that. Okay. You can get the World Nomads podcast on iTunes. You can download the Google Podcast app, subscribe, rate, share and and tell your friends about us. Hey, I just 78% of podcasts are discovered by word of mouth. So help us out there. Yeah, yeah exactly. Awesome. So next week, amazing nomad Angie Davis joins us. She's a photographer, filmmaker, and journalist who sold everything to travel around the world with her young family and barely a possession. Cheers. Bye. The World Nomads Podcast. Explore your boundaries.